So dysphagia is a symptom which patients uh, experience, uh, which is uh, essentially when food gets stuck in the gullet uh, or the throat area. It usually happens when people eating or drinking any type of food or liquid, if it gets stuck in the throat area, as they say, or the gullet area or the esophagus, which is behind the chest bone, that is what we class as uh, dysphagia. So it's basically food getting stuck. The uh, causes um, are uh, multiple, but generally we would class the causes of dysphagia into either structural problems. So if you imagine the gullet is like a pipe, so if there's any narrowing in the pipe, uh, which we call a stricture, for example, uh, narrowing in the pipe uh, could be caused from maybe long-standing acid reflux uh, damage or certain conditions like eosinophilicus vagitis uh, or... Um, uh, or even tumors or cancers that grow inside of the gullet that can narrow the lumen and then food will get lodged inside and doesn't go down. So that's what we call structural problems. But also the gullet has essentially a muscle wall or muscles in the wall of the gullet that help push the food down when you eat. And if there's weakness in the muscles or the valve at the bottom of the gullet is too tight and doesn't open, uh, because of muscle spasm, then uh, that's what we call motility type problems. So that's problems in the muscle that can lead to food getting stuck. There's a classic condition called epilepsy, for example. Um, other problems, uh, of course, with motility uh, uh, or, or nerve supply to the swallowing muscles. So we see patients who uh, have neurological problems. So after stroke, multiple sclerosis, uh, other neurological conditions where it affects the muscles of the swallowing, again, food can get stuck. Uh, as well. We see it after operations on the throat, of course, that can lead to scarring and again, narrowing and food getting stuck. So these are just an example. This is just an example of the, uh, of some conditions or the common ones that can cause dysphagia. Dysphagia, of course, is, uh, has a major impact on patients' ability to eat and drink. I mean, obviously we all love eating and drinking food. Uh, it's a main, uh, uh, kind of quality of life uh, measure and if you can't eat the food that you like food getting stuck and that can mentally affect you it affects your quality of life but more importantly it can lead to potential decline in health because you're not getting enough nutrients and calories uh, into your body so it can lead to weight loss and other nutritional deficiencies so uh, there are Several warning signs, which I always advise patients to be aware of. Of course, if the dysphagia or the food getting stuck problem is happening very frequently, uh, so certainly you know on a daily basis or once a week, then that should uh, raise alarm bells. And if it is also what we call progressive dysphagia, so if over time the frequency increases, then that is another alarm symptom. Of course, if patients having uh, food getting stuck and Bringing food back out, which what we call regurgitation, is another warning sign. Uh, weight loss definitely is a major warning sign. Um, and I think things like choking, coughing uh, uh, on food is another warning sign. And finally, chest pain as well. So chest pain, when food gets stuck, if you get chest pain, that's also a, a warning sign that you need to be aware of. And certainly you need to see a gastroenterologist. So dysphagia is a symptom that people experience, uh, and usually it's a symptom of condition rather than the condition itself. So actually the risk factor for dysphagia is depends on the underlying condition that's causing it, as we mentioned earlier. Is it a, you know, is there a risk factor for cancer in the esophagus or a risk factor for mortality problem? Uh, for example, a common cause of uh, dysphagia, which we see is long-standing acid reflux that can lead to uh, scarring in the esophagus, narrowing, and food getting stuck. So, you know, then you, of course, have to look at what are the risk factors for acid reflux, you know, being overweight, uh, family history, uh, smoking, all these kind of things can lead to risk of uh, acid reflux, scarring, and potentially causing dysphagia or food getting stuck. Also, we see that, uh, and people have family history of certain conditions that can lead to dysphagia. That's another kind of risk factor. Uh, but generally, I would say dysphagia, as I say, is a symptom rather than the condition itself.
So the main test, of course, which uh, we use to diagnose causes of uh, dysphagia or food getting stuck is uh, endoscopy. So that's a camera test, so you can call it endoscopy or gastroscopy, camera test through the mouth where we can see inside of the gullet, uh, uh, look for problems, we can take tissue samples uh, to uh, diagnose the cause of dysphagia. Uh, second test we use is uh, something called a barium swallow, where you take uh, stuff to drink and we simply just take x-rays of the gullet and that highlights any you know, pouches or narrowings in the gullet, etc. Uh, so that's a barium swallow. And the third test we use is what we call motility physiology testing. Uh, so that is where we test the muscle, the strength of the muscle in the esophagus. Is it pushing the food down uh, strong enough? And also we look at the valve at the bottom of the gullet. Is it relaxing, opening, closing properly? So that's what we call motility uh, testing. Treatment, of course, depends on the cause of dysphagia. It could be medications, uh, for example, in some conditions that we use uh, to treat uh, dysphagia. It could be endoscopic procedures. So we commonly use uh, endoscopic uh, balloon dilatation or other forms of endoscopic dilatation. So that's where we stretch the gullet. So if the gullet is narrow, we stretch it, uh, open it up by a balloon through endoscopy. Um, and finally, of course, surgery for certain uh, cases also.